Butler, master blender for Uncle Nears Premium Whiskey, and the great great granddaughter of Nears Green, the first African American master distiller on record. Uncle Nears Premium Whiskey launched in July of 2017. We're the only American spirit brand that is owned and led by a black woman, and we're the only American spirit that honors a black man. We are the most awarded whiskey or bourbon for 2019 and 2020. Most recently, we were named Spirit Brand of the Year by Wine Enthusiasts. The team at Uncle Nears strives every day for excellence. We pound the rock, sharing the story of love, honor, and respect. And we also make some darn good juice. Our brand ambassador for Alabama and Tennessee is gonna walk us through a tasting of our 1884 and 1856. Thank you for joining us here at Total Wine and More, the nation's leading retailer of wine, spirits, and beer. My name is Speedy, I'm the Tennessee and Alabama market manager for Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey and erstwhile steward of the brand. And I'm going to walk you through uh, our whiskeys and take you through a few cocktails as well. Now, I want to reiterate that Uncle Nearest itself is considered a premium whiskey and we happen to be made in Tennessee. And people often ask, okay, exactly what differentiates Tennessee whiskey from bourbon? Tennessee whiskey, when done properly especially, is bourbon plus one, plus one extra step. And that is the Lincoln County process. The man responsible for the Lincoln County process and what we know today as as such is uncle nearest himself tennessee whiskey fits all the criteria and checks all the boxes to be considered a bourbon a bourbon made in tennessee a tennessee bourbon okay plus that one extra step which is a charcoal filtration uh, we like to use abcs uh, in this case it's a through f okay so a b c d e f a stands for america because bourbon itself must be made in the United States of America. B stands for barrels, because whiskey itself has to be aged in new white charred American oak barrels, especially in Tennessee. Uh, they has to be aged at least two years. Uh, to be, you know, that's a straight whiskey. Uh, if it's aged less than four, it has to be stated directly on the label. Uh, C stands for corn. Now, within any whiskey recipe itself, it has what's called a mash bill recipe. And that refers to the grains that go into it. Usually your average whiskey is gonna play with any of four grains. You have corn, wheat, malted barley, and rye. Okay, so with the corn itself, the mash bill recipe has to use at least 51% corn. D stands for distillation. Bourbon itself must be st distilled no higher than 160 proof. Uh, in our case, it is, we go into the still at 125. We go into the barrel at 100. And then from there, we go into the next one, which is extras. Uh, there are no extras in Tennessee whiskey, especially with us. Uh, the only thing that's added is going to be pure water. All right, so there are no extra additives such as color or flavorings. The only thing is the water, and we use a minimal amount of limestone water because Tennessee, much like Kentucky, sits on one of the two largest limestone deposits in the United States. F. Now that we've reached from A, we are going into F. That is the filtration. The Tennessee whiskey does everything that bourbon does, plus that one extra step. So bourbon plus one is that filtration. The filtration itself where most Tennessee whiskeys are going to mellow over the sugar maple charcoal for no more than five days. We go 14 full days. We also use an additional uh, two extra carbon filters, coconut shell and diatomaceous earth. Here we come into the fun part, which is where we actually taste some whiskey. I know it's it's a, it's a hard life. It's really, really hard life. All right, so whiskey itself, you know, a lot of times it'll have that negative connotation like grandpa's cough medicine or something you knock back with a beer and a boiler maker or something like that. 
Uh, she is a delicate flower. She does deserve to be treasured and savored. So we're gonna slow it down a little bit. All right, so the first thing that we wanna do when we're tasting the whiskey and truly tasting the whiskey is much like a fine wine, you want to let it breathe. Okay, so we're gonna pour a little bit in the glass. Let it get in there and really open up. Okay, so what we're doing again is just letting this open up a little bit. And while we're letting it open up, we're gonna tell you a little bit about these whiskeys. So we'll start with my seven year old small batch, 1884. This is a one with Victoria's signature directly on the back because again, she is the first female African American master blender in the United States. And uh, you know, a lot of pride goes into this. So with the 1884, this is a seven year old small batch. So every barrel that goes into this batch is aged seven years, all right? It is 93 proof. On record, when Nearest Green was making whiskey for Jack Daniel, uh, it would clock in anywhere from 92 to 95 proof. So we wanted to stay true to that narrative. The 1884 significance of the number, anytime you see these numbers on the label, always have historic significance. So remember, this is history in a bottle, so we had to treat it accordingly. 1884 is the last year on record he made whiskey before he retired. Let's move over to 1856. 1856 itself is our premium blend. It is a blend of eight to 14 year old whiskeys. So if I were to slap an age statement on that 1856, it would say eight years old because you do have to state it as the youngest it's in the blend itself. So I like to say this is an eight year old whiskey with 14 year old characteristics. Significance of the number with 1856. That is a year that he is credited with perfecting what we know as a Lincoln County process, which as we know by now, what separates Tennessee whiskey from bourbon itself. All right, so going back into the tasting, when you taste, and I mentioned wine, uh, that, that's where uh, they are similar, you do want to let them breathe. But the tasting itself and catching the nose is wildly different uh, because <clears throat> with this, I do highly recommend you keep your mouth open and just to get your nose in there, instead of really getting your nose in there and catching the scent, <clears throat> What you want to do is just kind of dip your nose in uh, because this is much higher alcohol con uh, content than wine itself okay where wine is alcohol by volume apb this is proof so this is a 93 proof whiskey so if you really get your nose in there you're going to fry your olfactory so no one wants that right so you're going to want to kind of just dip in keep your nose in and out and your tongue to the concave of the roof of your mouth and just like that all right, so when it comes to catching the nose and then especially tasting, everyone's palate is different. But you're gonna start, let's start with the color on this, the appearance. So this one's more of, of, of a light straw and more of a honey leather color. And that's due to the aging seven years on this one. All right, so with this 1884, it, um, that I get a lot, I, I like to use food analogies. So with this one in particular, uh, you know, on the nose on this one, it reminds me a lot of like a cobbler. Okay, so I'm getting some like buttered brown sugar. Obviously vanilla is popping out a little bit and some nice baking spice. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, I just walk in and, and I just smell like a, a pastry chef doing their best work. On the palate itself, It reminds me a lot of like a creme brulee. And uh, so with that, I'm getting some honey notes, uh, mid palette, a little bit of apple shining through. And then on the finish itself, it's just, it's the finish on both these whiskeys, I refer to as a slow, exquisite burn because they hit the, the back of the palate and they're higher proof. And they don't, when you have a higher proof whiskey, you really run the risk of it just scorching you on the finish. And this one doesn't, it just slowly cascades and just warms as, as it goes down. It's just a slow warming effect. Uh, so I, I love the finish on both of these, uh, the 1884. I get a little more spice on the finish. It's a, uh, I get a little bit of pepper, but remember that there's no wrong answer. When you're tasting whiskey, every palate is different. Uh, so don't feel like you have to go and reference it, You know, get your Google on, anything like that. Uh, that's part of the fun is the adventure of tasting. All right, so moving on to the 1856. This one has had plenty of time to open up. This one, to use a food analogy, is a lot like, to me, uh, it's, it's, it's like biting into an oatmeal cookie. Okay, and hear me out on that. So 
you get the baking spices, definitely the cinnamon, the nutmeg, the clove. I get some, you know, some rich stone fruit, like apricot. And then, especially on the palate on this one, I'm getting some dark pitted cherry. So this one, you know, it's the same mash bill as 1884. It's just aged differently. So you'll notice the color. Let's go back to the appearance on that one. Compared to the 1884, which is a lighter straw color, this is more like a copper amber color. And that's due to the additional aging. So again, it's 8 to 14 years. So it is an 8-year-old whiskey, but there's some 14-year-old complexities in there. That, that really, it's just, it's outstanding. And again, this is a premium Tennessee whiskey. This is the history behind our brand. In the summer of 2016, our CEO and founder, Fawn Weaver, was on a business trip with her husband. She picks up the New York Times and reads an article titled, A Black Man Teaches Jack Daniel How to Distill. Fawn was so intrigued by the story that she convinced her husband to take her to Lynchburg, Tennessee. She wanted to find out more about this black man. Shortly after arriving in Lynchburg, Fawn is introduced to Sherry Moore. At the time, Sherry was selling real estate after a 31-year tenure with Jack Daniel Distillery. So Sherry informs the Weavers that the Dan Call Farm is for sale. And on the third day that the Weavers are in Lynchburg, they purchase the Dan Call Farm. Now, Dan Call was a preacher, but he was also selling whiskey. And Nearest Green is the man that was distilling for him. So Fawn goes about and sets up um, her research room there at the farm, she puts out ads in the paper uh, asking anyone if they know anything about Nears Green and his descendants. She assembles a team of, of 20 individuals that included um, genealogists and historians uh, to assist her in unearthing all she could learn about Nears Green. So Fawn's team is uh, hard at work. In the meantime, Fawn is meeting uh, descendants of Jack Daniel. She's meeting descendants of Nears Green. And she's meeting the townspeople of Lynchburg. And as the research starts to roll in, Fawn soon learns that Nears Green not only distilled for Dan Call, but he was also the first master distiller for Jack Daniel, making him the first African-American master distiller on record. So Fawn is having uh, meetings with the family, keeping them abreast of what she's learning along the way. And during the course of one of those meetings, Fawn asked the family, near Green's family, so how would you like to see Nears Green's legacy cemented in history. And one of the family members finally says, we like to see his name on a bottle. And so Fawn goes about doing just that. She reaches into Sherry Moore. Sherry again was retired from Jack Daniel as their director of whiskey operations. The lady is basically a walking encyclopedia when it comes to whiskey. Fawn brings in Catherine Jerkins and others, and they go about bringing this brand to life. And in 2017, our brand launched with our 1856. In March of 2019, I joined the team. As Director of Administration, my primary duty was to oversee the Nears Green Foundation. The Nears Green Foundation was created to assist Nears' descendants who were of, of college age and had a desire to further their education. And so the foundation pays for tuition and books all the way through to a student's PhD if they have a desire to go that far. 
And so when I came on the team, that was one of my primary responsibilities was to oversee the foundation. So in May of 2019, Fawn asked me to be the curator, the first curator of our 1884 small batch. Now the, the thought behind the small batch was Fawn wanted to pay uh, homage, more homage to Nearest's descendants and that a descendant would curate each batch. So I was the first one selected. Um, and in May, I go in uh, to the lab and I curate the first batch of 1884. In July of 2019, it hits the market and it is well received by our whiskey family. We start winning awards right out the gate with it. Gold, double gold. And then I, I curate the second batch. And in November um, of 2019, um, Fawn saw fit to elevate me to um, Master Blender, making me the first female African-American Master Blender on record. Joining the Uncle Nearest team is one of the best decisions I've ever made. In addition to working alongside the best whiskey family in the business, I have the distinct honor of continuing a legacy that lay dormant for more than 160 plus years. It doesn't get any better than that. So now I'm gonna flip it back over to Speedy and he's gonna walk us through some fantastic Uncle Nearest cocktails. Cheers. All right, so the first cocktail that I'm gonna do is a Tennessee Mule. Uh, so it's just a take on a classic mule, only a little elevated. Why? Because we did it. All right, so this one is going to be, again, with tandem with Hello Cocktail Company's Moscow Mule Mix. Very pronounced citrus and ginger, especially ginger. Really like the level that's in there. And then Apple Blossom Bitters. This apple bitters plays so well with this whiskey. There's some light hints of uh, apple in this one and really play well together, especially the cinnamon shines through on this as well and ties everything together. All right, so let's get right into it. This will have an ounce and a half of the 1884 itself. And again, this is one of those simple cocktails, very easy to recreate at home. And it's so refreshing, goes down so easy. You're gonna have an ounce and a half of the mule mix itself. Ginger really shines through. And then three dashes of the orange blossom bitters. And then I like to fizz it up a little bit, just give it a little pizzazz. Lends a little bit of effervescence, cleans it up real nice. And you know, it's not something you really have to take a lot of time stirring, just kind of mix it up together. You want to get those dance partners dancing. And then we're going to top it off with a lime wheel. And voila, you have your Tennessee mule. All right, so the next cocktail we're going to do is the Hella High Water. So this is a riff on a classic whiskey highball. It's very simple. Anyone can make it at home. And remember that anything you see in front of you, you can get for one-stop shopping directly at Total Wine & More. All right, so this one is a very simple cocktail, again, made with Uncle Nearest, 1884, seven-year-old small batch. And this, bitters and soda, aromatic spritz. This is delicious on its own, and it's really good for your tummy, for an upset tummy. All right, so... This one, much like the last one, is going to get an ounce and a half of 1884. Feel free to bump that up on your own. All right. So with this stuff, again, uh, it, it is, it's so refreshing. Look at that beautiful color. So that pink really shines through. With this bitters itself, you're going to get the gentian root really coming through on it. Just give it just a little bit of agitation there. All right, now this one also is gonna get an orange peel on top. Okay, so with the orange peel, when you're peeling it, you want to make sure and express it directly over the cocktail itself. And that way all the oils themselves are spraying directly into the cocktail. It kind of changes the makeup. And then here, just gonna give it a little squeeze and make sure that these oils go directly in and then just drop the garnish in 
itself. And there you have the Hill of High Water. All right, so the final cocktail we're gonna run through is 1856 Old Fashioned, just like the original, only better. All right, so the, the Old Fashioned itself is a classic cocktail and it's a classic for a reason. It's actually the most ordered cocktail in all of the United States. Anyone can make one. It's very simple, very easy to do. All right, so that stated, with ours, we're gonna run through with two ounces of Uncle Nearest 1856. Ultra Premium Blend. All right, so that was two ounces on that. We're gonna go with a half ounce of the Bar Smith Simple Syrup. And general reminder again, that anything that you see me using to make these cocktails can be purchased directly at Total Wine & More. So now you know where to find it, one-stop shopping. All right, so what this one is gonna do is the Mexican Chocolate Bitters is going to really change the dynamic of the cocktail itself, a little more uh, complex. Obviously, there are going to be some cocoa notes coming out of this and some cinnamon. And uh, that's two to three dashes, by the way. The Mexican chilies leave a little bit of a lingering spice. It's a delicious cocktail. All right, so we're just going to give this a little stir. And simple syrup is uh, very easy to reproduce, but why go through the hassle when you can pick up your bar cement directly at Total Wine? All right, in the glass itself, I have one single cube. I like to make my own clarified ice. But with that, any old ice will do. Again, you're making this at home, so treat yourself well and have fun doing it. So to recap, it was two ounces of the 1856, a half ounce of the Bar Smith Simple Syrup, and two to three dashes of the Mexican Chocolate Bitters. All right. And this one, to lend a little more acidity to it that really plays well with all the components involved, is a simple lemon peel. And just like the other cocktail, you want to make sure and express it directly over the cocktail itself. And that way, all the oils, all of that citrus goes directly into the glass. We're going to give this a little twist over it, just to get the additional oils out. Drop it in, and it is ready to go. Thanks for spending time with us, hearing our story, uh, checking out these cocktails. Also, a special thank you to our partners at Hella Cocktail Company, and a heartfelt thank you to Total Wine & More for allowing us to share our story and share these cocktails. Mm -hmm.